Spring is making ever more progress pushing into the highlands, slowly melting away the winter snow, though it's a three steps forward, two steps back process, and many times snow has revisited the highlands only to melt again a day or two later, but each time a bit more gone than there was before. But with the last melting of the snow, the meadows are at last clear and dry. And for the first time since the first snow of winter, the goats are at last going to be released from the stable and cut loose in their meadow where they can caper and play. And just as the goats revel in the first breath of spring, so the wildlife is eager to jump at this first taste of summer. Wild pigeons, also known as rock doves, visit the barn, and some of them are destined to become part of pigeon pie. Meanwhile, far out over the blueberry meadow, red-tailed hawks circle in search of foals. The snow and ice of winter, though, does a lot of damage to our fences, and Daphne and I scramble to restore them and get power back onto them because goats are escape artists. On this day, I left Daphne at the goat paddock to tap electric lines back into place while I ran to the cottage to go get the fence voltage meter. I came back outside to discover that Daphne had succumbed to the newly warm sunshine of late spring and decided to have a nap. Well, if she was going to have a nap, then I was heading to the woods. So I finished restoring electricity to the fences, went to the cottage, got my pack, and off I went. Seeing the land come back to life is always a marvel. And for the last several weeks, every other day has brought a deluge of rain to the highlands. If I lived elsewhere, this might bother me, but living at nearly a thousand feet, there's no way we can flood. For me, what this nearly continuous warm rain means is that the earth is going to come back to life sooner than before and be more vigorous than it often is. A bit later this summer, I'm expecting a gigantic mushroom harvest, and I fully expect that many of the things I regularly forage will be up sooner than usual. So I'm scouting twice a week now to make sure I miss nothing, because some of the things I forage at this time of the year are ephemeral, here and gone in just a few days. Here, at the very edge of the start of spring, the most fecund place I'm going to find where things are most likely to get a jump on growing up here in the highlands is down in the hollows. The hollows are sheltered from the wind by their geography and the riparian areas and have old growth trees around them that provide further shelter. The trees also serve to catch and hold the air, which acts like a blanket in these areas. Water is a heat capacitor and passing through, it serves to cool these areas in the summer and warm them up precociously during winter months. And so this is a good area to find a number of things that may forage. Among them, here is one of my favorites, the Eastern Tea Berry, scientifically known as Gaultheria procumbens, and better known to many as the wintergreen plant. To identify wintergreen, look for a plant with a glossy leaf that's almost oval in shape, though sometimes the oval can be a bit stretched out lengthwise and even come to a little bit of a point. The leaves are thick and fleshy and have deep veins. The veins run in parallel out from a central spine on each leaf, but they have the unusual characteristic of curving back in before they reach the lip of the leaf. They curl back into the next set of veins which have gone out from the spine in parallel and then curl out toward the lip again and then back into the next set of veins. In this way, the veins create lobes on the outer edge of the leaf. The top side of the leaf is so glossy as to look oily, while the underside is a matte pale green leaning toward white. The venation is so deep that it can be seen on the underside of the leaf quite clearly. Finally, gather a few of the leaves, crush them in your palm and smell them. If they are wintergreen, they will smell strongly of wintergreen. While wild wintergreen can appear in almost any temperate or boreal forest, I find them most readily in cool forests of mature to old growth hemlock near watercourses. When I had first spotted these small shelf fungi, I thought they were old bleached turkey tails. However, they did not feel velvety on top, and when I turned them over, I saw that these fungi were toothed. I don't know of any poisonous toothed fungi in upper temperate to boreal forests. These fungi are a curiosity that I'll try to identify later. Down there is a natural pool in the side of the river, sectioned off by that tumbled boulder and the log in front which has decreased the current around it. Abundant water skaters are found here, and other insects will breed here. This natural pool will probably serve as a nursery for young trout as the season progresses. I move down deeper into the hollow, and it is not long before I come across an unusual site, a raven kill site. It is very rare that a predator successfully takes a raven. It would take something clever and fast, and my best guess would be that it was a lynx or a bobcat. Both species mingle in this area. To me, the real prize of foraging this time of year is the ostrich fern. So I head down to the riverbank to check their progress. The first hints of shoots are emerging from the crown, 
Harvest time will begin in about two weeks. One has to be careful with these. Arrive two or three days late and you've missed them for the year. From ubiquitous raggedy old birches, one sees the black scar of Inonotus obliquus, chaga, emerging. However, I have enough chaga. I was surprised to see this ancient remnant of witch's butter, a cold weather fungus. It's emerging from a log that is so old and decayed that the outer two inches of diameter are long since gone. If it were late autumn or winter, I'd be more interested in it. But right now, I'm much more interested in this vine. This is Ganoderma suge, also known as reishi, a highly medicinal mushroom. It grows from logs and snags of dead hemlocks. It's easy to identify by its fan or kidney shape and its glossy red, freshly varnished look. Underneath, it is off-white and porous, an easy fungus to identify with no poisonous lookalikes. These fungi are old though, from the previous year, so I'll leave them alone and move away from the river and head into the hemlock forest at the higher ground. This is an old growth forest and a treasure trove of various fungi, and ancient hemlocks, two to four feet in diameter, abound. Here I hunt for boletes, lexinum, sweelus, dryad saddle, peppery milkies, lobster mushrooms, and I hope above all to find matsutakes, a tasty fungus that has the unusual distinction of smelling like old socks and spicy cinnamon. It's far too early to actually forage matsutake yet, but I'm just scouting, looking for hints where they might be in a few months. And in this old undisturbed forest, I find yet more chaga. So much I could almost wish I needed it. I'd been going full out since dawn, and so I decided to take a nap there in the shadows of the old forest, with the music of the river none too far away. When I wake, I find my mind especially on the prospect of Matsutake, as I've often encountered strong fragrances of cinnamon in these woods. Though I've looked for it here for years, I've never actually come across the fungus. While this woodland is healthy, nearby the woods have been butchered by forestry, and I wonder if the mycelia here has somehow been weakened by that. There's no way to know for sure, but one thing that is becoming more evident as science studies the relationship between fungi and trees is that they do interact and communicate even out to hundreds of meters away. I don't doubt that if all the forests roundabout were healthier, I would be farming this forest for Matsutake as well.